word. Uh, this morning we're reading the letter of Jude, the penultimate book of the Bible, and I'm reading from the New International Version this morning. Jude will read from verse 1 to verse 25. a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. <coughs> Mercy, peace and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign <clears throat> and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment in the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns <coughs> gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment <coughs> of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do not understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. <coughs> These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foam foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But, dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire, and save them. To others, show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. May God bless to us.
reading of his own precious and most holy word. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray now that by the power of the Holy Spirit you would speak to each and every one of us. Help us to be alert and to listen. So in the words of the boy Samuel, speak Lord, for thy servant is listening. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So here we have then the, the letter from Jude, which is just here in the, in the scriptures as the an ultimate book in the, in the New Testament. Jude, of course, who was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. And I think it's lovely how he opens and introduces himself. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. James also a half-brother of Christ. Remember, of course, that these men, Jude and James, they did not initially believe that their half-brother was the Messiah. But then, through the resurrection, they were wonderfully saved and they went on to minister in, in such ways. But here we have them with a, a call, and as he introduces the letter, he says how he is eager to write and uh, about the salvation and to share it and to encourage. But a more pressing matter is to guard your faith because the church is being infiltrated with heresy and really this book is about telling us to persevere and my title this morning is Stand Firm. Well, as we look at the state of the church in that time, I mean, they certainly needed that prescription to contend with the spiritual error of the day. Perhaps even more so, we today, in the church, generically, we need the prescription to stand against the spiritual errors that we see in our time. He's addressing here both Jewish and Gentile believers uh, in, in, in this letter. And mainly what he's addressing at this particular time is the heresy of Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism, very briefly, would believe that spirit is good. Spirit is God, and that is good. Matter is bad, and that is man, and that is bad and evil. So therefore, immediately we know that they did not believe in the incarnation of Christ, but they believed that it was spiritual. And then the word gnosis is the Greek for knowledge. So they believed that a, a, a special knowledge was given so that for Gnosticism, you had this special higher spiritual knowledge and that salvation is this special knowledge and that you're then raised and he's you escape out of the evilness of the body to be with, uh, uh, with the Lord. But this was a special knowledge for special people. That is gross heresy, brothers and sisters, as we know. Because we know in Ephesians 2, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and it's a whosoever uh, gospel. So we find ourselves then today at a 21st century church that's complex. It's confused, it's misled in many quarters. And of course, we all know that then and now, all of that comes from the adversary. It comes from Satan himself, who is the one who thrives on deceit and lies and confusion. From Genesis 3, did God really say he's planting the seed there as the serpent? And he's continues to do that right through the ages and right in up to today. Basically, if we divide this letter of Jude, it sort of divides up into verses 1 to 16 there. Jude describes the sin and the doom of godless men. He gives us the bad news. He tells us that what we see all around us, wherever we go, 
But then from verses 17 to 23, and more especially for us as Christians, he gives us an inspiration. He says, brothers and sisters, I'm calling you now to persevere. Persevere through uh, this and be encouraged and be lifted up <coughs> onto that higher spiritual plane. And then he finishes with that wonderful doxology in verses 24 to 25, which is well known to him. Come was able to keep you from falling and so on. Uh, so that is the how he structures his, his letter um, to us here. And in the confusion and turbulence of today's church, we can um, confront and we can protect ourselves in Christ, the solid rock. And how thankful we are for that, that we have an anchor in Christ for our souls, that's steadfast and sure, that he's the one who's the same yesterday, today, and uh, forever. And as we sit here this morning, brothers and sisters, may we know that gratitude within our hearts that we can indeed rest on him. As the hymn writer Thomas Obadiah Chisholm writes, Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I can say that. You can say that. Jesus Christ will maintain his church. He's building his church. As I pray, the gates of hell, he reminds us we'll not prevail against it. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. In Christ, we have the victory. Brothers and sisters, never, ever forget that. These are solid markers that you and I must hold on to in our faith in the turbulence of these days in which we live. And in reality, we are coming under more and more persecution. <clears throat> oh, Satan is getting busier and busier. So therefore, we need more than ever lessons on perseverance against him. And that's what Jude gives us there in that section, verses 17 to 23. The church today needs to hear this, and we as individuals, individuals need to heed uh, this. I'm sure that, like you, you've travelled many times on an aircraft. And you know when you get onto the plane and you get belted up and so on, then, before departure, we're given the safety drill. You know, the opening, the opening words of the, the young man or the young lady of the steward, the stewardess will come up and they say to you, Ladies and gentlemen, in the event of an emergency, this is what you do. You know, your life jacket's under your seat, you pull down the oxygen, do all these things. And that's important, the procedures that we have to do in a state of emergency. Well, let's be honest, many of us have travelled many times. We know it almost word by word. So what do we do? We keep reading our magazine, maybe. <laughs> Maybe we don't pay attention, do we? We don't lift up our heads. Well, friends, the state of emergency is, has been in our church for a long time. It's here, it has arrived. We need to be vigilant to God's instructions demonstrated here in his word on how we are to cope with this. Maybe you feel familiar with these instructions and maybe you're concentrating on other things in your mind at the moment. Well, Jude here provides us with sound practical teaching. So in our short time, I'm just going to look at attentively at these verses 20 to 23. And for he tells us these things, he says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. 
like us to focus very briefly on these verses and listen to what God has to say to us. So what this is, it's a call to perseverance. A call to perseverance. And it's twofold. It's a call to perseverance for yourself and also a call to perseverance for other folks. We need to be mindful of other folks as well. So he firstly says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, dear friends. Well, by putting our trust in and building our lives on Jesus, that makes us wise builders. We know that, don't we? Because the Bible tells us that. Because all other ground is sinking sand. So the wise builder builds on solid rock. The foolish builder builds their lives on other things. So unless you build your life on Jesus, your life is going to fall to pieces. Now, having made that foundation, then we must now build upon that sound faith. And we should take care with what materials we carry out our building. The right principles contained here in the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. And that, and only that, will stand the test of time and the most fiery uh, trials that the world will hurl against us. Hebrews 10, 25 reminds us, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage or build up one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. We need to come together and build each other up. We have this wonderful picture of building strong fellowship together in the bonds of peace. And different analogies we see in the scripture. For instance, the Apostle Paul gives us the analogy of the human body. All parts working together. One part hurts to all parts. But each part has a distinct part to play. The whole body works together in synchrony. But each part supports the whole you know, a finger can't just be a finger, heart just can't be a heart, it all is, is important. And with all of this working in harmony, we're looking to the head. We're looking to the head, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who's controlling all things. And we can take this at the individual level too. Apart from the, the fellowship, we can look at ourselves as individuals. And, and we need to relate one to another. And we see that lovely picture of the early church in Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to breaking of bread, to prayer, and to fellowship, where they had that koinonia, that beautiful harmony, one with another. But not only that, not only that, but they were a church who went out. They were a true community church because they were out there in the community and doing good to each and every one. They would sell possessions so that they could fulfill the needs of others. And indeed, through that, they won the favour of all the people. And then we read these wonderful words in verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because they were the, the, the model church and each playing their part. But the Lord built them up. So we need to be built up in Christ, friends. We have the truths of scripture, that's our approved materials. We work together and we build ourselves up individually also. We do that here and in any church when we come together on our Lord's Day. We do that when we come together and meet in our prayer meetings or other times of fellowship one with another. But he goes on, Jude says, also, apart from that, I want you to pray in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit, who is the only, who is the sole interpreter of the needs of the human heart, and the Holy Spirit that makes intercession uh, for us, we can put our stumbling words up to the to heaven into the heavenly courts. But it's the Holy Spirit that 
intercedes with these groanings, with that heavenly, heavenly language that words cannot express. He is our helper. And how thankful we are for the blessed Holy Spirit and that distinct personality he has in the Godhead. For his operation in connection with the Lord Jesus, in the birth of Christ, in the life of Christ, in the baptism of Christ, in the death of Christ, how he was there uh, at the creation of the world, how he is here in the church, and how he was given to us so wonderfully at Pentecost by the Father and by Christ. And he takes up residence in the hearts of believers. He is in that safe repository of our hearts when we become new creations in Christ. You see, he is also the one who eliminates, who illuminates rather, the, the word to our hearts and to our minds. So we have that access to heaven, to the Father and to the Son in and through the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, the Paraclete, the Advocate. So we also, Paul reminds us in Romans 8 and 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. The Spirit helps intercede for us with these groanings that words cannot express. And he also says, you see, um, thirdly, apart from fulfill yourself in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, he says, keep yourself in God's love. Keep yourself in God's love We're con to continue in the ways of God. And therefore, we, when we do that, we will continue in his love. You are where you are because of his immeasurable love. And he will continue to hold you in his love. As Apostle John reminds us, doesn't he, that God is love. And when we can only love because he first loved us. And of course his love for us was fully expressed on the cross of Calvary where the Lord Jesus Christ was our full and perfect propitiation. Brothers and sisters, we must always, always keep the cross, that ultimate symbol of love, continually before us as a remembrance of God's unconditional agape love. And we'll do that in a particular way at the Lord's table. And Jude says, also wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Well, our faith is built up, isn't it, when we keep our focus on our eternal home. Just say to Jim, we were coming in there, and says, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm, I'm going on, going on. I says, well, we're all going on. I says, we're looking forward to going home. Are we, Jim? We're looking forward to going home. Amen, brother. That's where our real home is, with the Lord in glory. And we look forward to that. We must have that eschatological outlook. That sounds a bit like a, a weather forecast, doesn't it? <laughs> well, let me tell you that the outlook is very bright indeed in terms of weather forecasts, but more especially in terms of heaven. We do not know when our Lord Jesus will come. We do not know when he will call. I can remember as I look at these seats, some of the saints who sat in these seats, they're now in the glory. I can remember further back, and some of you may have been here longer. We do not know when he will come or when he will call, but we do have that wonderful assurance of the gospel that he will take us to be with himself, which is better far. Friends, always set your eye on the final goal. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, may we say with him, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Amen. See, that destiny of eternal life is gained by mercy, not by merit. We can do nothing to gain it. But so these are, these are Jude's instructions for us 
individually. But we are also to hold others, he says, in the faith. We are to be, as it were, our brothers and our sisters' keeper. And this is our Christian responsibility for others. Verse 22 there, he says, we are to be merciful to those who doubt, to the doubters. We do all come into that category, don't we? Because we all have our doubts at some time in our Christian walk. But we must be watchful, we must be alert of Satan's snares for each other. Look out for each other. And also to defuse these doubts by sharing them openly with each other. Be open and transparent one with another. Because you see, doubt comes from the adversary. And he's extremely cunning at manipulating each and every one of us in the most effective, adverse way that he can. And then doubt, if it goes too far, it leads to backsliding. But still hold on, you see, because backsliding is not a cost to save. And still hold on to your brother and sister who you see backsliding. Never ever cast them off. Always encourage them and give them that element of hope. You see, in all things, we are to show mercy. Or as the King James puts it, compassion. And sometimes, dare I say, we evangelicals especially maybe, can be quite censorious. Can be maybe harsh, maybe se severe in our admonition with chapter and verse, yet we are to be of compassionate heart, brothers and sisters. Look how Christ was tender, sensitive, but very effectively convincing towards the doubters. And perhaps especially those men who were so close to him as disciples. We can think of Thomas, look how he dealt with Thomas, and also Peter, who denied him. Jude says also that we are to snatch others from the fire and save them. We are to rescue them from the birds of destruction. This is symbolized by fire, which is deadly and all-consuming. In fire, we perish forever. And this is what we are saved from. We are saved from the fire. So we must make every effort to save those who are in the, this perilous state <coughs> if they do not know Christ. It's powerful. It's serious. It's urgent. If people were trapped inside a house that was on fire out there, would you not do everything you could to save them? As the flames were engulfing them, getting stronger and stronger, would you not do your utmost and urgently to save them? Fire, of course, reminds us of hell, the eternal death. And that's a reality. Matthew 25, 41, the words of Jesus himself. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, hell was never prepared for man but for Satan and his angels who rebelled against God. So hell is essentially banishment from God for deliberately rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Oh, how we urgently need to evangelise those heading to that lost eternity of fire. And if also he says, to others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Never hold back on the truth, brothers and sisters. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a reality. The place where those who have not confessed Jesus as Lord and Saviour will go. And in all of this, keep yourselves Jude is saying, at the utmost distance from that which is or appears evil, even in sharing mercy, 
we may be trapped in the allurement of sin. And we are given this fearful picture of the wicked and being so corrupt here, Jude tells us, that even their garments are polluted by their, by their sinful nature. Such is the enemy. And when I read that there about polluted garments, it reminds me of my grandfather. Uh, some of you know I'm from Caithness. And my grandfather and many, many of my family worked at the, at the Atomic Energy the fast reactor station at Doonray. And every time they came off a shift, of course, the workers, they, they would be working in contaminated areas, they would be monitored. And one morning my grandfather was coming off um, night shift and he went through the monitor and the monitor bleep, 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 oh, set aside contamination. So they went through him and they discovered it was his shoes. His shoes were contaminated. So they were immediately taken away and they were being burnt, I guess. But the point is this. The shoes looked perfectly normal. You couldn't see anything. But the reality is that radioactive contamination is deadly and had to be destroyed. And that reminds us that sin, you don't see sin on the outside because sin is deep in the recesses of our hearts, isn't it? And we don't see anything outwardly, but sin is deadly. It's deadly like, like radioactive material. And it sticks to us. You can only get rid of it through the blood of Jesus. <coughs> Friends, let's just tie this together with a couple of points of application. You see, at the end of the day, please go away from here and remember, Satan is defeated. Amen? Amen. Amen. Satan is defeated. And Jude concludes by focusing on God, who is fully able to keep us. And he gives us a lovely uh, doxology. So, we know the bad news. Well, then we know the good news too, and that's what we have to cling to. Now, I'd just like to read something from... Um, a book I have on my shelf, but I keep it there as a, a, as a faithful um, <coughs> It's a, a Faith to Live By by Professor Donald MacLeod. And MacLeod addresses this question here. Why should we go to hell? Question mark. He says this. But surely the most important fact about hell is that none of us need ever experience it. All the persons of the Trinity are seeking your salvation. Let me make it as personal as I can. They are seeking your salvation. God the Father gave his Son. God the Son laid down his life. God the Holy Spirit loves us. How then can we go to hell? Not when there is such love in God. Not when there is such salvation in Christ. Not when all the persons of the Trinity are seeking your salvation. That will be the most terrible thing of all. The moment when God calmly asks, Did you hear of my love? Did anyone ever tell you that I sought your salvation? Did anyone ever tell you that my Son and my Spirit also sought your salvation? Did anyone ever tell you that I gave you my son to be your saviour? Did anyone ever tell you how it would pain and grieve me to condemn you? Did no one warn you not to put me to that grief and pain? What will your answer be? Brothers and sisters, let me just in conclusion read these wonderful words in the Dexology in verses 24 to 25. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the 
only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Friends, I cannot expand on, on these words. These words are pure spiritual gold to our hearts and our, our, and our minds. These powerful words will build you and me up firm in our faith to withstand this week ahead of us. Indeed, for all the days that lie ahead of us in our earthly life until we're home safely in that heavenly harbour. So, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those in doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy <coughs> with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And remember, when you go out that door, you enter the mission field. So go, tell, and do it urgently. To God be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, your word that speaks truth to our hearts and to our minds. Lord, help us to, by the enablers of the Holy Spirit, to digest that word, so that we would, as the Apostle James reminds us, not only be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. Lord, I pray that if there are any of us who are suffering from doubts or as yet have not fully given ourselves to you, <clears throat> that we would indeed consider our position and beseech you and speak to others. But Lord, in all things, we want you to have the glory, the honour and the praise. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.